Welcome everyone to our lesson on labor economics. And in today's lesson, we are going to look at the labor demand theory. By the end of this lesson, you will understand the concept of labor demand and its relationship with wages, and also be able to identify and describe the factors affecting the demand for labor. So basically, there are three markets for firms. We have the labor market, capital market, and the product market. So the labor market is technically where firms make decisions on how many workers to employ, and workers also make decisions on whether or not they want to offer themselves for, for hire. So this is one of the three markets where the firms must operate in order to survive, because technically, hardly will firms be able to do away with labor as far as production is concerned. In the capital market, this is where uh, capital, such as machinery, factories, warehouses, and anything that is considered an equipment uh, is traded. And that happens in the capital market. And the product market is where products or goods and services are, are sold. And so the labor market and the capital markets are the major market in which firms' inputs are actually bought. Now, demand for labor and supply of labor lie at the heart of the study of the labor markets. So technically, on the demand side, there are employers who are making decisions about the hiring of labor. And on the supply side, we have workers and potential workers who also decide about where to work and whether or not they also want to work. So the labor market outcomes in the labor market include the terms of employment and the levels of employment. So for the terms of employment, employers and workers will have to come together and establish the terms of employment in terms of the wages, the compensation levels, and the working conditions. And then for the levels of employment, we are looking at differences in occupation, whether a worker wants to be a teacher, wants to be a doctor, wants to be a lecturer. Uh, we can also look at differences in skills or demographic groups. So the demand for labor is the quantity of labor that firms are willing to employ at, at a given point in time. The demand for labor shows how many workers firms are willing and able to hire at a given wage rate in a given period of time. So the economics principle behind this is that if the demand for a firm's output increases, then the firm will employ more labor so that they can produce to meet the demand. And so do you recall the law of diminishing marginal returns in microeconomics? The law of diminishing marginal returns maintain that as more units of a variable factor, in which case we could consider this to be labor, is applied to a fixed factor such as land or capital, the additional output increases, reaches a maximum, and then falls. So technically, the firm's production is associated to a concept that we refer to as marginal product. So what is marginal product? Marginal product is the change in output resulting from employing an additional unit of input. So technically, when we are looking at the change in output resulting from employing additional unit of capital, then we are referring to that as marginal product of capital. If we're also looking at the change in output resulting from employing additional unit of labor, then we are referring to that also as the marginal product of labor. So the change in output resulting from employing additional worker is called the marginal product of labor. And the law of diminishing marginal returns emphasize that as we employ more units of labor and apply to a fixed input, such as capital or land, the marginal product, which is the additional output, rises initially, attains a maximum, and then falls. So we have a given table on the screen. Now we do have the number of workers. That is from no worker employed to 10 workers that are employed. And we are looking at the corresponding output in the second column, the total product produced by each worker employed. And then we end up calculating the average product, which is going to be the output per worker. That is the total product divided by labor. That is the number of workers. And then the marginal product was also computed by taking the change in total product divided by the change in labor. Since marginal product is simply measuring the additional output uh, that the firm is able to get given additional units of labor that it employs. And so for instance, when the second person is employed, the total product by that second person is 27 units. And so the average product, which is the total product divided by the number of workers, 27 divided by two simply gives you 13.5. 
But then at the, at the second person employed, how much additional output did that additional worker bring on board? So when the number of workers was already one, the total output or the total product was 11. When the second person was employed, the total product was 27. So moving from one worker to the second worker, what is the additional output that the additional worker was able to bring on board? And that simply means we take the total product at the second worker, and then we simply take the difference between the previous output by the first worker, and then we divide by the second uh, 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 worker minus the first worker, and we end up getting the 16. So the 16 is going to be the additional output that the second worker brought into the production uh, in the firm. And so when we go ahead and plot the total product curve, we will have a curve that looks like one that is shown on the graph on the right hand side of the table. So we have the total product curve increasing. Now at the very initial stages from the first to about the second, third worker, you can see that the total product was increasing, but at an increasing rate. And then from the fourth worker onwards, total product was seen to be increasing, but rather at a decreasing rate. Okay, we have instances where at a point the total product begins to fall. That is when marginal product actually becomes negative. But we are going to consider a situation whereby the total product that is being produced here is positive, average product is positive, and marginal product is all positive in, 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 in that particular firm for which we are making this study. And so if we want to compare the marginal product and average product, we simply have to plot the curves Okay, the two curves, average product and marginal product in, in relation to the number of workers employed. So the number of workers is found on the x-axis and the average and the marginal products are found on the y-axis. So by plotting those curves, we have this graph that is shown on the right-hand side of the table. So clearly you can see that both average product and marginal product all increase initially. But one technical thing that we need to look out for is that the orange curve is the marginal product and the blue curve is the average product. So let's take it this way. Marginal product curve lies above average product curve at the point where average product is increasing. Okay. So when average product is increasing, the marginal product curve is lying above the average product curve. So we can say that marginal product is increasing faster than average product. Okay. Even at a point where marginal product becomes um, maximum. So let me just apply the ink. Even at the point where the marginal product becomes a maximum, you can still see that the average product is still increasing. And then when marginal product is falling, the average product attains a maximum and also begins to fall. So at the point where marginal product curve lie below the average product curve, the average product is also seen to be falling. So let us consider the profit maximization of the firm. Now we are going to assume a perfect competitive firm. Now firms operating under perfect competition are such that they are the price takers. So it means that the market forces of demand and supply actually determine prices established in the, in the market. So the perfect competitive firm is the one that is going to take the price and so cannot influence price in the market. Unlike the monopolist, where the monopolist is the single producer or seller of a commodity, the monopolist reserves the power to influence the price of the good in the market or influence the output, but although not both at the same time. And so in this case, if we are assuming a perfect competitive firm, we are looking at a firm that would take the price in the market, uh, which is determined by the forces of demand and supply. So the firm here cannot alter the price in the market. However, the firm can make decisions on how many units of labor and capital to employ. And so when we consider the profit function of the firm, it is simply revenue minus cost or total revenue minus total cost. And the revenue is obtained when we multiply the price of the good in the market by the quantity produced, and then we get the revenue. And then the cost of the firm is also dependent on the units of labor and capital the firm employs and how much the firm has to pay for acquiring those units of labor and capital. And so the W stands for the wage rate, which is the cost of labor, how much the firm has to pay for the units of labor L. And then the R is also rent, which is the reward to capital. That is how much the firm has to pay for hiring or renting capital. So when we put all this together into the profit function, we have PQ minus the cost part. All right. So we are trying to say that the P, which is the price in the market, 
is that particular variable that the firm cannot manipulate as far as they are operating under perfect competition. But rather, the cost portion of the profit function is what the firm can manipulate in order to realize the profit it so desires to have. So it can influence the units of labor and capital to employ. Now we are going to consider the short run uh, production. So recall in production theory in microeconomics, we looked at time periods of production. So we have the short run, the, the, the long run, and we even have a very long run. Now, in the short run, we explained during the microeconomics course that the short run is a time period of production where some inputs are considered to be fixed and then others are also considered to be variable. So in the short run, the time is so short that there are some variables that a firm cannot actually manipulate, like capital. So in the installation of machinery, in the building of warehouses or factories, it becomes very, very difficult to build a warehouse or a factory in the short run. So capital, for instance, will be considered to be fixed. But labor, the firm can decide to employ labor today and dismiss that labor today and employ another one tomorrow. So in the short run, labor is variable. So we are looking at a time period of production where some inputs are fixed and others are considered to be variable. So, the firm can actually determine the additional output produced by each worker. Remember, we mentioned that the firm cannot alter the price, but can alter the labor and capital to employ. But if we are considering the short run, then we are going to assume capital is constant because that is going to be fixed in the short run. But in the short run, labor can be altered or changed. So the firm actually operating in the short run can alter labor. And for every worker that the firm employs, the firm will be able to determine the additional output produced by each worker the firm hires. And so that additional unit of output produced by each additional worker is simply referred to as the marginal product of labor as we established before. So if you want to obtain the money value of what each additional worker actually produces, we need to calculate something we call the value of marginal product of labor. That is, we have to multiply the marginal product of labor, that is the additional output by each additional worker, by the price of the good in the market. And so when we do that, we get the value of the marginal product of labor. So mathematically, the value of the marginal product of labor simply equals the price of the output times the marginal product of labor. So just as we can calculate the value of the marginal product of labor, the firm can also determine the average product by each worker. That is the output produced by each worker, which is the average product of labor. So to determine the value of the average product of labor, we can also multiply price by the average product of labor, and then we get the value of average product of labor. So we go ahead and extend our table and add two more columns where we calculate for the value of marginal product, VMP, and the value of average product, VAP, by assuming that the price of, of the unit of output in the market is two Ghana cities. And so what we are going to do is we simply have to multiply this price by the marginal product to get the value of the marginal product. So at the first worker that is employed, then that worker is able to add 11 units more to output. And so if we measure the value of that 11 units, we just simply multiply 11 by the, 20, by the two Ghana cities and then we have 22 Ghana cities right here. Okay. And then also the output per that one worker is 11.0. And so if we also multiply by two, we get 22 for the value of the average product of labor. So technically, when labor, okay, the second worker is employed, then we can simply take the additional output by that worker, which is 16. We multiply by two Ghana cities, and then we end up getting the value that this second worker contributed to the sales uh, by, by the firm, all right? And also, we are able to determine the value of the average product by simply multiplying the output per the second worker and then we multiply by the two Ghana cities price of output in the market, and then we end up getting the 27 that we can find here. Now, how many workers should a firm hire? Technically, the perfect competitive firm can hire all the labor that it wants, given 
a wage rate in the in the labor market in the market. So let's assume that the wage in the labor market is actually 22 Ghana cities. Then what would the firm do in terms of how many workers to employ? So we go back to the table and then we get to realize that when the wage rate is 22 Ghana cities, then the firm will have to employ eight workers. Why? Because the value Okay, the value of the marginal product contributed by the eighth worker now simply equals the existing wage rate. So technically, why eight workers? This is because at this level of employment, the value of marginal product of labor equals the wage rate and the value of marginal product curve is downward sloping. Now let's elaborate on this more. So what we are going to do here is when the first worker was employed, now, the additional output by that worker was simply 11. And so the value was 22. And you can see that this value at the first worker employed also equals the existing wage rate. That is to say that if the wage is 22 Ghana cities, if the firm hires the first person, the firm is going to pay this particular person 22 Ghana cities. And the value that this particular worker brings into production is also 22 Ghana cities. So technically, I would not lose if I employ the first worker. Now, the firm realizes that I will still be paying the second person 22 Ghana cities. But then the value that this second person also brings into production is 32 Ghana cities, which is much more than what I will be paying the second worker. So I will go ahead and increase my number of workers from one to two. The firm realizes that if it employs the third worker, that third worker is also going to bring 40 Ghana cities more value to, to production than what I will be paying the third worker. So I'll go ahead and hire the third worker, pay the 22 Ghana cities, and I'll be getting 40 Ghana cities value by that particular third worker. So you can see that at these levels of employment, the firm will continue to increase the number of workers. All right. So the number of workers that the firm will have to employ, considering the wage rates in, in the market, is not going to be at this point because this is the rising part of the value of the marginal product curve. But the firm will keep on employing. So at the fourth person that is employed, although the value of marginal product decreased from 40 to 38, but the 38 Ghana cities is still more than the 22 Ghana cities I'm paying the fourth worker. So I'll go ahead and increase the number of employment and employ the fourth worker. By employing the fifth worker, this person also has the value of marginal product, although decreasing, the value is still greater than the wage I am also paying. So I will go ahead and hire the fifth worker. So I'll keep on hiring the number of workers until I arrive at the eighth worker where that worker is able to give me 22 Ghana cities for the same value that I actually end up paying uh, that eighth worker. Now, this is where I'm going to stop employing more labor. The reason is that if I pay the ninth person 22 Ghana cities, that ninth person is going to bring me a value of 18 Ghana cities, which is much lower than how much I am paying the ninth worker. So I will not go ahead and employ the ninth worker but I'll rather stop and then employ the eighth worker. So the firm at this level of employment will have to employ these eight workers because it is at the point where the value of the marginal product of labor equals the wage rate. And it's also occurring at the point where the marginal, the value of the marginal product uh, curve is downward sloping at the point where the marginal product is downward sloping, not at the point where it is increasing. So technically, mathematically, we can just go ahead and write it something like this. So um, where, why, what employment decision would a firm make? The employment decision by the firm will be to employ the number of workers where the value of the marginal product of employing that worker equals my wage. And then at a point where the value of the marginal product of labor is falling. So when we go ahead and take our table and then plot the number of workers on the x-axis against average and average product and marginal product on the y-axis, the very same graph that we saw earlier on. Then where we actually considering, um, that is where we actually considering that a firm will making its employment decisions is going to be the downward sloping part of the marginal product curve. So at the point where the marginal product is falling, because at that point, at those points, the value of marginal product is also falling. So the downward sloping part of the marginal product curve tells us what happens to firms' employment as wage changes, holding capital constant, because we are looking at a short-run situation where capital is considered to be fixed, but labor can be varied. So we are looking at 
the downward sloping part of the marginal product curve and, and how it relates to firms employment as wage keeps on changing. So let's take it for instance that we have taken the downward sloping part of the marginal product curve and plotted it on the graph as shown on the screen. So what we are doing is recall that we said that in the labor market, the wage rate was 22 Ghana cities. So the firm will go ahead and employ the eighth worker. That is where the value of the marginal product of labor actually equals the, uh, the wage rate. Okay. So that means if I pay the eighth worker, if I employ eight workers, they also give me the same value as how much I'm paying them, right? But what is going to happen if, for instance, so that is the 22 Ghana cities here, and then the number of workers that the firm actually employs. What is going to happen if the wage decreases from 22 Ghana cities to 18 Ghana cities? Now, technically, if the wage rate decreases as a firm, I would have to hire more workers because labor would have become relatively cheaper, Okay. But it is when the wage rate actually increases that I will have to reduce the number of people that I hire. So what I'm going to do as a firm is that when I am paying a worker 18 Ghana cities, let me go back to the table and you will see that if I'm paying the worker 18 Ghana cities and the value of the eighth worker is 22 Ghana cities, that means I am getting more value in output than how much I am paying the eighth worker. I am paying the eighth worker 18 Ghana cities and the eighth worker is bringing me 22 Ghana cities in value. So I will go ahead and increase the number of people that I, I want to hire. So I will end up hiring the ninth worker and I will get to realize that the ninth worker also brings me a value of 18 Ghana cities, which is now equal to the wage rate of 18 Ghana cities. So then I'll stop. Because if I employ the 10th worker, that 10th worker is going to give me a value of 14 Ghana cities, whilst I'll be paying that 10th worker 18 Ghana cities. So that means I will lose. So I'll stop at nine. So technically, you can see that when the wage rate was 22 Ghana cities, the firm employed eight workers. And then when the wage rate decreased from 22 to 18 Ghana cities, the firm ended up employing how many workers? Nine workers. So are we seeing a relationship here? When the wage rate decreased, the number of workers increased. So there seems to be a negative relationship between wages and the number of workers, wages and labor. So technically, the short-run demand for labor curve is downward sloping, all right? It is negatively sloped. This shows that there is a negative relationship between wages and the number of workers employed. There is a negative relationship. So that is to say that, for instance, at this particular wage rate, this is the level of labor that I'll be employing. If the wage decreases, then I'll also go ahead and hire more workers. If the wage decreases further again, then I'll go ahead and hire more workers. So there is this negative relationship between wages and then labor. And so this is the nature of the labor demand curve, which is negatively sloped. Now, we also have the long run demand for labor, but that is beyond the scope of this course. And that is going to be an isoquant production, um, isoquant production function. And we covered this in managerial economics um, last year. And so uh, we're not going to go much here because in labor economics, uh, the discussion of isoquant labor demand curve is going to be beyond the scope of this course. So don't worry about that. Let's proceed. So what are the factors that affect the demand for labor? The first one is wages. Technically, we've seen that there is a negative relationship between wages and the number of workers to employ. So when wages go up, it becomes more expensive to hire workers. And so firms will end up hiring fewer workers. All right. And then if the wages go down, then it means that labor becomes relatively cheaper. And so firms will go ahead and hire more workers. In terms of the demand for a product, if the demand for a particular product produced by the firm increases, then the firm will have to hire more workers in order to produce output that meets that demand. On the other hand, if the demand for the product also decreases, then firms will have no uh, option but to reduce the number of workers or even lay off some of the workers there. Technological change. So as new technologies emerge, that can also affect the demand for labor because it makes some of the existing jobs become old fashioned, obsolete, and hence create the demand for new types of workers with different skills. So let's take it for instance that uh, back then we used to have people who were typing on typewriter machines. 
And the typewriter machines were such that whenever you type a letter and you make a mistake, you would have to start all over again by bringing in a new paper and start typing. And so at this time, we now have the Microsoft Office, Microsoft Word, where we use it to type. And whenever we make a mistake, we can simply press backspace on our keyboard, we erase it, and then we type the correct thing. So it means that in this century, we have the demand for people who know Office productivity tools, okay, who know how to type in Microsoft Word and all, all those sort of things. But the um, uh, typewriters, hardly do they even exist till today. I, I cannot even think of a firm that actually uh, has employed uh, some typewriters uh, to be typing on typewriter machines when we have Microsoft Office and all of that. Okay, so as new technologies emerge, it makes the existing ones obsolete. And so it creates a demand for new type of workers. And that is what firms will now be hiring. Then production costs. When the cost of production of a firm increases, then the firm will have to hire fewer workers in order to drive costs down. But on the other hand, the firm will go ahead and hire more workers if the cost of production also decreases. And then the availability of other inputs. So for instance, capital. If capital is much more available than labor, the firms will have no choice but to employ capital. And that means they will have to reduce the number of workers. So labor demand will fall. And also if the price of capital, for instance, is very, very cheap, then firms will also have to employ more capital. And so what happens to labor demand? It goes down. So uh, they will have to employ more capital in order to replace uh, labor. And then government policies. So laws and regulations can also affect the demand for labor. So for instance, if the government go ahead and slaps taxes on, work, on, on, on firms, then that will also increase the cost of production of firms. And for that matter, the firm will have no choice but to cut down the number of people to employ. So some of these policies that can affect the labor demand and, and, and influence firms to actually employ less labor are minimum wage laws and then the imposition of taxes on the firms. And on the other hand, if the government also enact policies that give subsidies to firms, then that means the government will be absorbing part of the cost of production of firms and the firms can have the resources well enough to actually hire more labor. So um, these were the factors that are affecting the demand for labor and that is the labor demand theory. So at this point, we'll bring the lesson to an end and I'll be taking in questions if you have them.